Here we go then. Pretty much unanimously requested from last week's part two. We are going to take one more skip into the future in this Northern Irish TV money experiment. Will it be able to build on those promising signs and make it to a top level or even good level league? Or will it wilt away at the 30 and 40 years in the future mark? If you're looking forward to finding out, please do put a thumbs up on the video as we are back for part three of our Northern Irish experiment. If you did miss the first two, they're up in the eye above. You can find them as well as a whole host of other key playlists and links from the channel. A massive thank you for your support as always. If you want to stay up to date and find out what the next experiment is, then subscribe down below and turn that notification bell on. There will be an experiment video next Sunday. Sunday, something completely different to round off the month so hopefully you're looking forward to that you can support the show as a channel member down below too but thank you as always for watching as we head straight over to fm for 30 years in the future 2051 time travel let's go 30 years in july 2051 here we are northern irish football have you taken that leap forward or have you stagnated and started to go the other way? My eyes have just been drawn away to an Everton signing of Ricker. It's a Mario Ricker as well. So the same region that we had in our Hemel Hempstead save. And he's a very similar striker as well. There you go. There's something that's taken my eye very quickly. But let's get to the main story today. Northern Ireland. Year 30. How have things been going? Let's start, as usual, by going and having a look at the clubs and seeing how the facilities and stuff behind the scenes is looking. Pretty good, I'd say the answer is immediately. And still no change on the stadium front, starting with Balamina, but the side expected to finish bottom are rich and with good facilities across the board. Let's just keep moving down to see if the pattern's the same. So the facilities have taken a leap back up again across the board. They're excellent, they're top notch across the board here. Now we've got our first new stadium as well. Cole Rain are in the Oren Kearney Stadium, a 12,000 all-seater virtually. That's a big step forward. Crusaders, still the same stadium, the facilities are good. Glenarvan have gone backwards a bit in the process of a takeover though. Glentoran, much the same. Institute, much the same. Larn have got top facilities. They've moved into the Larn Stadium as well, 10,000 all-seater almost. Windsor Park still for Linfield, but very good facilities. Porter down great, Port Stewart okay, and Warren Point not too bad at all. But we can see where the smaller clubs in the nation are, certainly in terms of this league anyway. But a couple of new stadiums and lots of facilities, that might be a good sign. Let's have a look at the second tier by comparison. Average and good facilities, pretty similar across the board. Not expecting any new stadiums at this level, considering we only had two at the top. No, I think we're we're pretty much across the board with average to good facilities in the second tier. One excellent there for Miola Park, but no stadiums at all. And then let's have a look at the third tier. Has that started to catch up? Because that's what the nation needs really, is consistency across the three divisions. So again, no change on facilities, but all rich, all got at least adequate or average facilities. One good there for distillery, and Dale are adequate. Much the same across the board. That's a club that's just come up because they've only got secure finances and below average facilities. Everyone else though, adequate, average or above. No new stadiums beyond the top tier. I've just clicked on this one and it was an accident, but I found Ben Godfrey, the former Premier League player, is manager at a third tier side in Northern Ireland. That's a positive sign on the reputation front, isn't it? We've got to say that. What we're going to do, though, is go and have a look at what's been happening to the league. So we'll look at the top tier, we'll look at the transfer prices, we'll look at the quality in Europe, the coefficient, all the big stuff. I'm hoping this is a big step forward. Well, headline news immediately. The Danske Bank Premiership is rated higher in terms of reputation than the English Championship. That is a huge step forward. We're talking three star there. Must be three star at that standard. It's right at the top of three star as well. So we're talking about a league now where the players should be worth plenty of money because that was the moment where it ticked over in our Bangor City Builder Nation in FM21. When the league reached three star reputation, we saw a massive lift. We've got a mix of Coleraine and Linfield dominating the nation. Institute had one good year in between. We'll have a look at those two clubs as our point of reference later. I want to have a look though at the transfer fees that we've been seeing. Are there big ones? Yes, there are. A domestic one already this summer from Lahn to Cliftonville. 
3.6 million pound wow look at that standard of play up that is a very different level to what we were seeing before Lan signed the player from qpr in their 20s that's got to be a good sign let's go back to the previous year 13 million Colrain have sold a player for so the values are definitely going up they signed a player from west brom for seven and a half million adel amari is a french under 21 international of the past and a very solid at least championship standard centre half. Vestin Bakiri, Burnley to Institute, 5.75 million. Not so good, but a younger player. Corain, more players from Norwich from West Ham. Very good goalkeeper from West Ham. A very good right back. Northern Irish international. This was the thing that was missing last time. Senior internationals for the home nation and now playing their football regularly in the league. And the wages, I'll be honest here. Given what we saw earlier in the save, I look at that player who's probably a top championship slash very bottom Premier League defender. 36 grand a week is near enough around par. I can live with that. I didn't see what the wages were for the others. The one to institute less than 10 grand a week. 28 grand for the French centre half. And who else have we got? A big one to Lan. That one moved on to Cliftonville is on 11 grand a week. Joe Henderson, 32. So we're in the same sort of ballpark. The wages have leveled up. They're not having to match out the reputation now because it's caught up. So we've got to a stage where one Colrain are signing massive players from the Championship and Premier League, but also they're able to pay them fairly rather than having to go miles over the odds. Let's just go back a few years before to see if that 13 million is eclipsed for an out and seven and a half for an in. Wow, yes it is. So the goalkeeper that was sold, 15 and a half million he was signed for the year before. And he made their money back the next summer. That's a good sign. Linfield spent nearly 14 million on a player from Stoke. Michael Thornton, very good goalkeeper again. And 26 grand a week, a relatively fair wage. Liverpool sold a player to Lan for 11 million. Brazilian Youth International. Right, the standard of players here are phenomenal. This is a big, big step. If they can keep this up. Northern Irish football can settle then as a top 20 league if they keep doing this. Surely looking at the standard of players coming in, there's got to have been some European progress. Albeit the post 10 million stuff looks like it's only come the last three or four years. But when we get to 40 years in the future, hopefully we'll see a change. But this is phenomenal. Really is a big step up. I'm delighted to see it. I think we're going to have to have a look at the European coefficient in a minute because there's got to have been some change here. Looks like Colrain have spent the biggest, so let's start with Linfield because they have still somehow won the last two titles. They've got a manager in Lawrence Jeremiah who is English and who is exceptional on 37 grand a week. So the standard of coaches are still very good. Got a big reputation as well. If we have a look at the club reputation, two and a half star, in the Champions League, key player is Simeon Kelsey, who is fantastic. Yes, 33 now, but a proper quality midfielder and someone who's played 150 league games for the club. Captain Jonathan Heiter, 32-year-old fullback who's very good. And vice-captain, a Portuguese, who is a quality right winger and at peak age as well, 25. There's a lot of promising signs in Northern Irish football. This is what I was hoping for. Maybe 10 years earlier. It's taken a bit longer than we thought. But the league is now competing. It's up there with the championship. That's all we can ask. Let's have a look at the highest value players. So Thornton the keeper we've seen already. Let's have a look at Connor Burke. Centre half. 23 years of age and really good. It's a championship level squad. It is predominantly British. But we're seeing a few players pop over. We looked at the Portuguese lad. There's one from Norway here. One from France a bit further down. There is a little splice of the continental style coming in. And I'm all for it. This Linfield side looks good. How have they been doing in Europe though? That is the big question. Last season, Europa Conference group stages. Lots of wins. Got to the knockouts. Lost narrowly to Montpellier of the French League. That's a pretty good effort. Year before, Europa Conference group stages. And they hadn't even been league winners that season. Right, so they were a best place team, starting in the Europa Conference qualifiers, second qualifying round, so must be in at least the top 18 or 19, wherever it is in the qualification places. In the group stages, they didn't get through this time, but 
got there from qualifying as a runner-up. So Colray made the groups as well. That could be a sign of why Northern Ireland has gone forward so much. Didn't make it the year before, lost on penalties. Year before that, weren't in Europe. Year before that, Europa League group stages. Didn't make it out of them, though. Year before that, Europa Conference group stages. So, fairly consistently in European group stage football. I don't think we can be unhappy at that. Let's have a look at Coleraine as the other big boys in the nation. Scottish manager who is very solid. Only on three grand a week though, which seems a little odd given the investment elsewhere. Maybe he came before the big investment from the club. If we look at their general stats, two and a half star reputation. Not won the league for three years now, but had won a few prior to that. If we have a look at their squad for their star players. Their top rated ones in terms of value is a Scottish goalkeeper, Daniel Harold, who we've looked at before, is very good. Quinn Winter is another Scott who's all right. The one after that is Patrick Webb, the fullback we talked about. He's absolutely brilliant and on a relatively good wage. Romanian defender at 30, who's solid, championship level. English centre-half, very good one at 28 years of age. Again, signed from QPR, championship, League One players, moving over comfortably throughout. The French centre-half we've seen, Garmin Potts, the Welshman, very good player and a Welsh international, an active international. But hang on a minute, on £165,000 a week, I don't understand that. I'm going to have to look at Linfield to see if there's an outlier now as well. No, they haven't got one. Theirs are all pretty well maintained. But Coleraine have randomly got one player on £165,000 a week. Can't quite explain that one personally. Where did he come from? Stoke, so not like they've gone and signed a Manchester United or an Arsenal player, a marquee signing. They've got a good player in, but that's still an extortionate wage on their front. Let's see how they've been doing in Europe in recent years. They should have still been in qualifiers. So last year, got through qualification pretty comfortably. Made it into the Europa Conference group stages. Got through them to the knockout round where they lost narrowly to Fenerbahce. Year before that, didn't make the group stages. Year before that, Europa Conference, they made the groups. They didn't get through the group stage, unfortunately. Year before that, Europa League group stages made it through to the Europa League knockouts, where they were battered pretty comfortably by Ajax. No shame in that. Year before, no Europe. Year before, Europa Conference group stages. They didn't get through the groups there. So definitely the last four or five years... They've been getting through in Europe and looking a lot stronger. So those big money investments are certainly a much higher quality of play at this time around. Let's have a quick look at the European coefficient. That is the main thing we want to focus on here. Have we seen the big jump we were hoping for? Well, firstly, on the bottom right of the Europe screen, Preston Talan is a major transfer now. The striker who's actually very good. So good signs on that front. They're competing with some of the bigger leagues now. Let's see the qualification places. Okay, they're on their way up. So they've got into that top half of the 20s where it's three teams who qualify straight into the Europa Conference second qualifying round. Can they get up though to places like 17th, 16th, 15th where you're getting extra teams qualifying for bigger tournaments? That is the next step to come. How far away are they in terms of coefficient points? They at the moment are on 23.1. But let's be honest, it is a big jump up. What we've got to hope is that the next year a few of them fall away as it's suggesting they might at the minute because otherwise I can't see how they break into that top 20. So in our final look in 40 years, that's going to be something we have to look out for. Are they going to be able to catch some of these nations? Probably not enough for my liking, but we have to appreciate this as a very big step. Let's have a look at the individual club coefficients. How well are they competing overall and whereabouts are they in the grand scheme of things for clubs across Europe? So Northern Ireland, we have got Coleraine in 111th, Linfield 124th, miles clear of the rest. Institute actually produced one of the best years, the season they won the league. So if they'd been able to get into Europe consistently, it might have been a different story. Because they must have got past the group stages. You can see based on the last year for Coleraine and Linfield, they must have got pretty far. But definitely signs of progress. The problem is Coleraine's best year or second best year is about to drop off. If Linfield though can make it consistently now after three years where they've done pretty well, we could start to see movement. I'm not sure how the next 10 years are going to go. At what point does Northern Irish football hit its ceiling? 
That's what we're going to find out in a moment as skip ahead to 40 years and our final stop off in the future. And our final stop off of this experiment sees us in 2061 where I'm wondering if they've taken the next step with Northern Ireland or if all that progress is going to leave us with a disappointing climax 10 years on. So let's go straight to it. We'll start with the same screen again. What are the facilities like and have we got any more new stadiums? Well, starting with Ballymena, who are now expected to finish a bit higher, but have exactly the same facilities and stadium. Bangor have moved up a division, excellent youth facilities, but nothing else has changed. Coleraine currently reduced their capacity a bit, so I wonder if they're upgrading. Maybe, looking at the fact they're predicted to finish first, have they now finally become the powerhouses? We'll have to wait and have a look. Crusaders, expected to be second, but nothing else has changed. What does that mean for Linfield then? Because Dungannon are expected third. We might have a problem here. And it's something that plagues these Builder Nation saves. Unlike England, where you see money rises the cream to the top over and over again. It's not happening in these nations. We get a complete turnaround of who dominates every few years. And it means that no one gets settled at the top of the coefficient chart. No one consistently takes that next step. And I think we've got the same issue here. Lana have still got their new stadium. Linfield still at wins apart, but expected to finish bottom half. Right, we need to know what's been going on there. Let's get straight into the transfer screen. I want to know what sort of money's flying about. Well, it's not gone far, but it has moved into the top 20 of competition reputation. It's up there with the Danish Superliga, the Norwegian top tier. It's above the Polish league and the Ukrainian league now. So definitely making progress still. Slower, but it's still getting there. Linfield won the European playoff, which I'm guessing is probably a good thing based on what we saw before. But look at the right-hand side. Colerain, 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 and a bit more Colerain. So Linfield carried on for another couple of years after our last stop-off. Larn had a year, Dungannon have had one in the middle. But it is all Colerain at the top of Northern Irish football. They are going to have to be the saviours here. Let's have a look, though, at the transfer fees first. We have got, right, regular 10 to 15 million signings coming in. Lang got a player from West Ham for 10.75. He's a very good young striker. Colerain, 17 million from West Brom. And then one from Dungannon domestically for 10 million, who again is very good. So at least we're seeing moves within the division. If Colerain are dominating, they have to sign some players from within the nation to keep the money flowing around. The year before that... Bournemouth to Colerain, £12 million. Very good striker. Dungannon signed one from Leicester. That's the same one that then moved on to Colerain. There are big deals going about. What's the biggest one we've had? £12 million the year before. Bournemouth seems to be a stomping ground. That guy, who they've signed from South Korea, is a brilliant player. 80 caps. He looks genuinely on the verge of world class. Very good Premier League level for sure. Let's move back to the year previous. 12 million again, this time Dungannon. That must have been the year they won it, but a very good winger. Not quite sure how someone of that standard hasn't got a cap for Wales, other than they don't value the Northern Irish League as much as the Prem. I don't know. Let's move back another year. 13.5 million, this time from Brentford. I'm going to have my suspicions here. We're not going to have time to check it. I bet they're just raiding the relegated clubs each year, aren't they, from the Premier League? Certainly looks like it from the, the calibre and standard of clubs we're looking at. What's happened the year before? Warren Point, £15 million from Leicester, now 28 years of age, but a good player. That is a shock for the books, because Warren Point, one of the smaller sides in the league, not won any titles at all. Balamina the year before, £11.5 million from Blackburn. I'm just wondering, looking at that, if the Northern Irish League maybe had its golden peak in the mid-2050s. A player that's now retired went from Arsenal to Institute for 15 million. And that would suggest they were around 30 at the time. That's big. Year before that, Cliftonville, 16.5 million. Now a coach, but from Bournemouth. And the first year after, 12.5 million, Dundee to Larn. Big deals, they're continuing. They're top championship, low to mid Premier League level. But what has that done for the European coefficient? Because Rain have been absolutely dominant. And I want to know what they've been able to achieve. Let's start with them and how they've been getting on in Europe. They're managed by former Northern Irish international Daniel Ballard, who's got awful stats. That doesn't bode particularly well. 
But let's see what the players are like. They've got one on over 100 grand a week. That is a Dutch centre-half who's now 32. But Garmin Potts, who was the big earner 10 years ago, still there. Spent his whole career at the club, but earning under 100 grand now. The South Korean is well worth the money he's on. And everyone else is pretty good. That Thornton, he's been there 10 years as well. They've managed to retain players throughout a career. That's a good sign too. What are the schedules looking like though? Have they made it late into any European stage? This season, Europa League group stages. Got through to the Europa Conference knockouts. They got to the quarterfinals. Lost to Dinamo by the odd goal. Beat Glasgow Rangers in the second knockout round. Beat Pacos Ferreira in the first knockout round. That's an excellent effort. They beat Glasgow Rangers. The Scottish League is loaded as well. That's incredible. Let's look at the year before. Europa League group stages went straight out though. Year before that, Europa League group stages. We're not even looking Europa Conference now. Got to the Europa League knockouts. Beat Nice at home. Went out on aggregate. Year before, no Europe. Oh, so frustrating. Year before that, Europa League group stages. Got through to the Europa Conference knockouts. Lost by the odd goal to Legia Warsaw. Year before that, Champions League group stages. There's your klaxon. What did they do? Lose every game, I assume. Yes, basically. Next year, no group stages. The inconsistency is startling. Year before that, Europa Conference group stages didn't get through them. Year before that, Europa Conference group stages got to the last 16 where they lost to Bodo Glimp. Year before that is the first one after. Didn't even get to the group stages. Let's have a look at Linfield because they were stars the first couple of years. And how much have they fallen away since? A lot by the looks of the finances. But let's see what the schedule is like. So no Europe last year. None the year before. They've had four or five years away now. So that means that the coefficient will have dried up. All that hard work will have been undone. Their last group stage football was 2053-54. On that occasion, they got to the quarterfinals and just lost out to Slavia Prague. Year before that, Europa League group stages didn't get through it. And the first year after our last one, Champions League group stages. Right, the inconsistency is going to cost us here, isn't it? I'd hope they've moved up a couple of places because the Champions League one in itself makes you a lot of points. But I don't think it's going to be as promising as we would have liked. And it's just the inconsistency of certain teams. However, we've got a few Northern Irish deals on the major transfer screen now. So let's look at the nation qualification places. They're in the top 20. They're so close. They're two places away from getting someone into the Champions League second qualifying round rather than the first one. They're then only a couple of places away from getting a team into the Europa League and a second team into the Champions League. It is such a big step that they're so close to achieving. I really don't know if they can push it because once you get there and you're guaranteed to get two or three teams in group stage football, you make massive progress. We saw that in the Bangor City save, but they're just on the cusp and I can't see them getting across the line. The club coefficients, well, maybe I should take it back because the last year is their best ever. What's frustrating about it is that the two years at the start were good. Then they had one really crap year in 59-60. If that had even been the same as the other three years prior, they'd have already been in 15th place. They are actually due to go up by two places this year. And with that, they'd go 17th and get the team into the Europa League qualifying or at least the team into a latter stage of Champions League qualifying. So they are almost there. Maybe we're just one or two years away, but I'm not going to have another look in the future. Let's have a look at where the clubs have moved up to, because this is a barometer of consistency. So last time it was 111th and 124th, wasn't it? Coleraine, 70th. 70th. Dungannon, hang on a minute. Dungannon, 82nd. Last year, 15 and a half coefficient points. So we need to finish off by having a look at Dungannon. What's happening to their football club? Their captain's an Italian. They've got a player on 59 grand a week. They've got plenty worth a bit of money. What on earth did they achieve? Based on Colray making a quarterfinals, they must have got further, did they? No. They got to the second knockout round, but they won their home leg, and I guess they got all the way through qualifying, beating the likes of Partizan. The year before, they went out in qualifying, though. 
They have got to back that up this season. Are they even in Europe? Where did they finish in the league? I want to know. They were general facilities. They're not in Europe. So they get all the way to the last 16 and then they don't even qualify for the year after. The inconsistency is so, so frustrating. How did the league table finish? How can you finish eighth? I don't get it. But that is roughly where we're going to leave the experiment. While I do the outro, I'm just going to join a club just so we can see how much money's in the bank. So let's actually go and join Rain and see just how much they've got to work with. So they've got a new stadium. They're expected to finish top. They've had regular European football. I want to see the money in the bank. Are oh, we do that? If you want to get this save, I will put it down in the comments below. It'll be available for two weeks to download. But let's see. Three-star reputation. I didn't see that as well. Colrain have leapt up another half a star as a club. So how much money is in the bank now? 314 million. So it's going down a bit, actually. It's a bit of a grotesque fee. I guess because they're spending massive money on transfers, aren't they? We look at the last couple of years for Colrain. This year they've spent 32 already. Year before, 30 million. Year before, 40 million. So they're actually spending championship slash Premier League sums on footballers. But they have got a really good squad. If we go to the scouting and have a look at what standard of player can be bought in, I would imagine it will be pretty good. If we go to the ones who are doubtful to sign, we're talking 50, 60 million players, young stars from clubs like Arsenal, so a Greek striker there who's quality, or 23-year-olds at Aston Villa in the championship. So it's top championship players or young or very experienced Premier League ones. But it is a very good level. And this nation... Do you know what? I'll be honest with the 30 and 40 year mark and say I probably didn't expect it to get to this level. So I'm pretty impressed. Yes, in real life we could argue that it should have gone further. But given what we've seen in previous editions of FM, I didn't expect it to even reach this stage. Certainly from where they were at the 20-year mark. This is a massive, massive surprise to me. So let me know down in the comments what you thought overall. The save will be down there if you want to download it over the next couple of weeks. If you did enjoy it, please do chuck a thumbs up on the video. Thank you as always for your incredible support. Subscribe for daily FM22 content, including a new episode of Top 3 later today, which will be up in the eye above with the rest of the playlist. I'll see you again later for a new Top 3. Thanks for watching.